Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think this is a perfect place to spend a Friday afternoon hearing about the uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy budget uh, for for fiscal uh, 2015. Um, we are grateful that we're able to put together this forum this afternoon to have uh, once again a reprise of this annual uh, event to really take a look at the, particularly the Department of Energy's budget and what does that really mean with regard to investments by the government in terms of efficiency in renewables and the implications of that and what that means for trends, et cetera. We've got a good panel uh, to talk about all this and to provide a lot of perspectives and to uh, to kick off our our forum this afternoon, I first want to turn to Ashley Johnson because with uh, Congressman Reichert's office of Washington State, uh, because Congressman Reichert is one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. And this briefing is an annual event that the caucus uh, is involved with with uh, um, with EESI, and so we're very very grateful that Ashley is here as well. Well, thanks everyone for being here today. The congressman uh, definitely wanted to join, but is back in Washington State. And as Carol mentioned, uh, he is the co-chair with uh, Congressman Van Hollen of the um, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, um, which is a bipartisan caucus um, that holds number of educational events um, such as this one and um, also helps um, facilitate the energy uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency expo uh, which will be happening in July um, up on the hill and uh, we're very excited about that and excited to uh, hear from our panelists today um, and um, I know that my colleague in um, Van Hollen's office um, is on her way um, so I will just um, let our panelists kick it off, starting with Jason, I believe. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here uh, on a Friday afternoon. Um, I, I, we're, this is actually, uh, there will be a lot of information to absorb for a Friday afternoon, so I'm impressed uh, by all of you who made it here. Um, uh, as Ashley said, my name is Jason Walsh. I, I'm a senior advisor and the director of strategic programs uh, in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy uh, at DOE. Um, I, let, let me give you actually a little bit of background uh, on the place where I work um, because I think it's important context. Um, EERE is the largest office in the federal government uh, focused on developing clean energy solutions. Um, you can see uh, up here on the screen our, our vision, which is a strong and prosperous uh, America powered by clean, affordable, and secure energy. Uh, and our mission, which is to create and sustain uh, American leadership uh, in the uh, global transition to a clean energy economy. Um, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But um, EERE is comprised of 10 technology offices. Uh, organized into three sectors, sustainable transportation, uh, renewable power, and energy efficiency. We also have a, an Office of Strategic Programs, which I run, uh, which uh, aligns and leverages and maximizes the impact of the work in our technology offices, but then also engages in a whole series of cross-cutting activities that are not specific to particular technologies, everything from, from some of the energy finance work we do to tech-to-market work to policy and analysis. Um, let me talk a little bit more about that mission statement because uh, it's really a foundation for how we approach this work. It's our belief that our nation stands really at a critical point in time in terms of the competitiveness opportunity uh, in the global clean energy economy. Uh, in 2013, $254 billion was invested globally uh, in clean energy. Uh, representing roughly a 450% increase since 2004. Uh, we know trillions more, uh, probably tens of trillions, will be invested in the years ahead. Uh, China pulled ahead of the United States as the global clean uh, energy investment leader in 2012. They extended that lead uh, in 2013. 
uh, essentially what is happening is that the world is accelerating into what will be a decades-long transition to clean energy. And that is resulting from two what we believe to be unavoidable and very significant trends. One, uh, a, a, a growing global population, uh, up to roughly 9 billion uh, by 2050, that is hungry for energy, uh, energy that is affordable and reliable. And two, the need to, uh, to reduce carbon pollution. Uh, in order to avoid uh, the, the, what could be catastrophic consequences uh, to our economy uh, and society and environment of climate change. Right. And as that transition unfolds in the years ahead, we believe the United States is really faced with a stark choice. Right. Uh, we can invent and manufacture the technologies uh, of today and tomorrow uh, uh, here in the United States, or we can surrender global leadership and import those technologies from other countries. We can continue to waste uh, literally hundreds of billions of dollars on unnecessary energy costs, um, or we can increase uh, our competitiveness and our productivity by investing in more efficient homes and buildings and factories. These are really significant choices that we've got to make uh, as a nation. And I take the time to say that because I'm, I'm hoping that you see uh, our budget requests uh, very much in that context, in that bigger context. Um, okay. Um, before uh, I tell you what we're asking for, let me tell you a little bit about what we've accomplished. Uh, and and, and th this is just a snapshot from the last couple of years, and I'm, I'm not even going to go through all of these for lack of time. Uh, but let me let me just uh, um, mention a couple at the top. So first, commercial cellulosic ethanol plant uh, uh, up and running and uh, producing cellulosic at commercial scale in Vero Beach, Florida. Uh, and actually, last month, our, our principal deputy assistant secretary went down to the uh, uh, NASCAR event at Sebring, Florida, uh, where the cars were using uh, fuel supplied. Uh, by the biorefinery down the road uh, at Vero Beach, which not only to our minds was a, kind of a significant milestone uh, technologically, but just really cool uh, to use the technical term. Yeah. Uh, super truck, uh, that second bullet. Um, we have a partnership with the four biggest manufacturers of heavy-duty trucks uh, uh, in the country who collectively represent about 90% of the heavy truck market. Um, the, the goal of Supertruck is to, is to increase uh, freight efficiency by 50%. So really, really significant numbers. Uh, and last year, Cummins Peterbilt, one of those four, actually hit that 50% marker. Uh, we expect the, the other three to hit it uh, this year. We actually had the Cummins uh, Supertruck uh, in town last month, uh, and, and there was quite a scene as different... Secretary Moniz and my boss, the Assistant Secretary, clambered into the cab and got their pictures taken behind the wheel. It was kind of a nice, nice moment. Uh, but the, the more important point to make is that although commercial trucks only make up 4% of vehicles on the road, they use 25% of the fuel consumed in the United States. Right? So you, you, you make a dent there. You're making a, a very big dent on overall uh, national fuel consumption. Um, and then battery cost. Uh, we hit our cost reduction target of $325 uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, last year, uh, we are on track to hit 300 this year and, and ultimately on track to hit uh, $125 dollars per kilowatt hour by 2022. Um, and, and this you know, uh, translates into a trend that has, has uh, just been accelerating, right? So since uh, 2010, the cost to manufacture advanced electric vehicle batteries has dropped by more than 50%, right? And not coincidentally, last year, Americans bought nearly 100,000 plug-in electric vehicles, nearly twice as many as sold uh, in 2012, right? So this stuff is happening now, <laughs> right? And it's scaling up in a really dramatic way, and we think we can, we can scale up even more dramatically in the years ahead. Um, so... That's anecdote, uh, but there, there is no substitute for uh, rigorous third-party uh, performance evaluations uh, of our impact, and we take that very seriously because 
it, it is extremely important to us that we spend our precious taxpayer dollars in a way that maximizes impact uh, at every point. Right? So uh, what, what this shows is um, an aggregated uh, estimate of the combined ROI of the percentage of our portfolio, which is roughly a third, uh, that we have done third-party evaluations for. So we is actually the wrong pronoun. Uh, others have done it. Uh, um, and these involve counterfactuals, and it's, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's quite rigorous, actually, some of the most rigorous evaluations done in, in the federal government. Um, and we, the parts of the portfolio that we have done these evaluations of cover uh, PV solar, wind energy, vehicle combustion engines, geothermal technologies, and advanced uh, battery technologies. Um, if you aggregate all of those results, uh, it, it finds that the total EERE taxpayer investment of $15 billion uh, yield, yielded an estimated economic benefit to the U.S. of $388 billion for a net ROI of more than 24 to 1. We think that's a pretty good investment and a pretty good payback uh, on that investment. Okay, so now, now we turn to what we're asking for, uh, for FY15, which is $2.317 billion, uh, which uh, represents continued investment in our three major sectors. Again, they are sustainable transportation, uh, renewable power, and energy efficiency, um, all of which remain key priorities of this administration. Um, it's worth noting that the, the, the uh, total FY14 budget request for ERE was $2.78 billion, so this request is lower than that, but it is a little more than $400 million more than the enacted uh, 2014 uh, levels. So um, this is uh, the, our budget summary table. Uh, a lot of numbers here. I'll, I'll, I'll flag that the largest increases are in our advanced manufacturing office, uh, our weatherization uh, and intergovernmental activities office and our vehicles technologies office uh, with continued strong support pretty much across the board. Um, I'm now going to walk through the requests for each of our technology offices. For, for lack of time, I can only highlight one or two items for each of these. If, if I don't mention something that you, you care a lot about, it doesn't mean we don't care about it. It just means I don't have enough time. Uh, and we can have a conversation in the Q&A about it, or, or we can also have a follow-up conversation and answer any questions that I uh, can't answer up here. Uh, and, and there will be many that I can't answer, because there's a lot of detail here. Um, okay, so let's start with sustainable transportation sector. Uh, and let me start with our Vehicle Technologies Office, which is leading the department's efforts to support the president's EV Everywhere Grand Challenge, uh, and, and will continue uh, its emphasis on electric drive technologies uh, and um, uh, the accelerated development of advanced batteries uh, with better performance and reduced system cost. Um, uh, we are also going to be working on wide band gap devices uh, for automotive applications. These are advanced power electronics which have enormous potential for a lot of different applications in the clean energy space and improved motor technologies with reduced or no rare earth materials, which as many of you know, uh, we face constrained supply lines uh, for many of those materials. We will also continue our support for advanced combustion work and, and uh, super truck, which I just mentioned, is actually very much a, a centerpiece of that. Uh, we're also going to be placing a lot more emphasis on ultra lightweight vehicle substructures and carbon fiber technologies. The latter in particular uh, shows tremendous uh, promise for the automotive industry. Uh, I missed one. Bioenergy. Um, let me flag in particular here our uh, demonstration and deployment subprogram, which is that second bullet down, uh, where, where really a lot of the focus is going to be on uh, drop in hydrocarbons, uh, which is, I think many folks know, are compatible, fully compatible with today's engines uh, and fuel delivery infrastructure. Uh, in particular, it's worth flagging our work here with DOD. Uh, and USDA to demonstrate and deploy uh, military spec jet fuel, which we think is an enormous uh, first market opportunity uh, that we're really uh, excited about. We'll also be making uh, new investments to enable uh, some of our technologies to validate scale up um, and, and accelerating momentum for advanced biofuel production in the wake of uh, some of our successes in cellulosic ethanol. I mentioned 
uh, the Enios uh, biorefinery coming uh, online last year. We expect two more to come online this year. Uh, and, and so the more they scale up, the more they can reduce their price and, and the more they can deploy out into the market. And fuel cells. Um, uh, the, the budget request for, for fuel cells remains almost identical to our FY14 congressional uh, appropriation. Uh, our, our FY15 uh, efforts will focus on reducing the cost and increasing the durability of fuel cell systems. So for example, uh, reduction in the uh, platinum group metal content of the fuel cell catalysts uh, will help to increase the power output uh, to more than twice the 2008 baseline, which we think is a significant uh, milestone to shoot for. And let me move on to uh, renewable power um, uh, and solar, uh, which is a subject I know that is near and dear to Scott's heart. Um, uh, so look, there is a ton going on in solar. We could talk about this for, for the remainder of our time. Let, let, me, um, let me actually flag that 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 bullet at the bottom, which is um, uh, is our innovations in manufacturing competitiveness subprogram, uh, which uh, has a substantially increased request for funding. Uh, look, here's here's the deal: the U.S. Uh, currently manufactures less than three percent of PV cells and modules globally. Right, and as solar deployment takes off in this country, and so to give you a, a sense of scale, uh, since 2008 solar deployment has increased, PV deployment has increased by a factor of over 13, right? As it takes off in this country and globally, we really want to try to reverse the trend of offshoring uh, of component manufacturing uh, and assembly. And, and we think we can do that through technology and process innovations that, that really create or, or that are really linked to the competitive advantage of US-based companies uh, that are high value add and high tech. Um, I mean, we did, uh, the, the bottom line here for us is that we think there is a, a clear opportunity for US businesses to capture a greater portion of the global uh, solar value chain. I think there, there, there has been um, a lot of assumptions made about where and, and how US manufacturing can, can, can compete in this state in this space based on some pretty comp on some pretty comprehensive analysis that we've done and NREL has done we think we can you just got to target it right. um, I will also mention the balance of system soft cost reduction work that really continues to be a focus of our sunshot initiative um, uh, e even though we've we've dropped solar technology costs precipitously uh, since 2008 by roughly two thirds, the, it's the soft costs that are really sticky right now. And soft costs encompass a lot, right? They they encompass uh, siting, uh, permitting, uh, interconnection standards, customer acquisition, labor. There's a lot of work to be done there. We, we through our rooftop solar challenge, we've we've done a bunch of it, and we will continue to do a lot more, particularly with state and local governments who can really. Uh, really pioneer some best practices in this space, and, and hopefully uh, we can spread those best practices around the country as much as possible. Wind power uh, technologies. Um, I would say the two major highlights uh, of this request are, are the, the three offshore wind demonstration projects, which we're going to select this spring. They're not selected yet. Uh, and the new Atmosphere to Electrons initiative. Uh, I think many of you are familiar with the potential here. Offshore wind um, could become a major source of clean energy for, for the coastal and Great Lakes states that account for nearly 80% of U.S. electricity demand, right? Uh, and, and in terms of resources, you know, we've got wind energy resources within 50 miles off, off our coasts, uh, equivalent to meet four times the nation's current annual electricity production, right? So, so there's a lot of resource there. We just got to be able to harvest it in an economical way. Um, the, the the funding in 15 will continue a five year uh, initiative begun in 2013 with with multiple competed awards. We actually made seven, I believe, that began development of the first U.S. offshore wind energy products. Uh, excuse me, projects. Um, we don't we don't have a. a um, this is really where the sort of the federal government role comes in, right? Be because it, it is imperative uh, for investors and 
businesses and even contractors in this country to, to, to get a clear demonstration that this stuff can work <laughs> and, and a clear understanding of, of the challenges that need to be faced, which is why we think these demonstrations are so important and really is, is our way of, uh, well, an opportunity at least to leapfrog global competition to advance the creation of essentially a new U.S. energy industry, right, which has significant potential. Um, let me talk about water, um, and, and Carol, if I'm running out of time, please let me know. I'm, um, I'm trying to go fast. The, so the, the Water Power Technologies Office will undertake uh, actually a new initiative in 2015 called Hydro, what we're calling Hydro Next, uh, and the purpose of Hydro Next is to expand the renewable generation of clean hydropower uh, in, the, in the U.S. with the goal of enabling the doubling of hydropower generation by 2030. And we're going to focus with this initiative on technologies and tools to improve performance and sustainably increase uh, generation at existing uh, dams, uh, and existing infrastructure. Uh, it's also going to focus on, on lowering the cost and improving the performance and reducing the environmental impacts uh, of hydropower for new uh, stream reach development. Uh, bottom line, we think we've got a lot more energy output from our existing uh, hydro power fleet that we can economically take advantage of, uh, and it's sitting there, uh, and we think we need to focus on it a lot more. Uh, geothermal technologies, uh, I, I, will, uh, I will focus on the, what I think represents the biggest effort for us in this space in FY15, which is the startup uh, of the FORGE effort, FORGE, um, uh, is, is, stands for Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, which will be a dedicated field lab site for testing and validating um, uh, cutting-edge enhanced geothermal systems, technologies, and techniques, uh, which in turn will uh, accelerate the commercial pathway for large-scale EGS uh, power generation in the U.S. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with EGS, th this is a really tremendous resource opportunity that's actually available in all regions of the country because you got if you go far enough down there, hot rocks uh, under all regions of the country. And, and the the estimates coming out of the U.S. Geological Service uh, are significant just in terms of, of what this represents as untapped resources. They estimate anywhere between 100 and 500 gigawatts. Right, uh, which is enough to power millions of homes. Um, obviously, we'll get a much more precise sense of how much of that is economically recoverable through, for, through this kind of effort. Okay, let me turn finally to uh, our energy efficiency uh, uh, sector, uh, and I will start with building technologies. Um, there is obviously a lot of work in this space. Uh, let, me, let me actually flag the... That, that bottom bullet, equipment and bullets uh, and buildings standards, uh, where our goal really is to, to scale up our assistance and collaborative work with states and localities in uh, adopting and complying with and then enforcing, we don't do the enforcing, the states do, uh, building codes. Uh, and, and, and of course what we work on with them is model building codes uh, for residential and commercial buildings which will result in higher performing, build, higher performing buildings that maximize cost-effective uh, energy savings. The numbers here, of course, are huge, right, if you, if you do it right. Uh, and so that's why we see it as a real opportunity for scale-up. Uh, I'll mention as well our residential building integration sub-program uh, where we will continue to develop uh, cost-effective new technologies, but with more of, of a focus on... Um, uh, it, it, sort of individual systems uh, that, that are retro, retrofitted one at a time. We've had done a lot of work on sort of whole home approaches, whole house approaches uh, over recent years, and, and, and we're taking a slightly different tack here and really trying to take a more granular approach, which we think tracks uh, a little bit better to uh, how consumers behave in the marketplace, right? Uh, which is that they, they typically do these one system at a time, you know, HVAC here, windows here, roof there. Um, advanced manufacturing, again, uh, a lot to talk about here, and, and uh, one of our biggest uh, request increases uh, from the previous uh, budget request. Um, this request will support the creation of at least one new uh, clean energy manufacturing innovation institute, 
uh, and will continue to support, support two existing institutes, one of which we just announced uh, in January uh, on uh, advanced power electronics down at North Carolina State University. Uh, we put out a funding opportunity announcement last month uh, for one on, on, uh, on composites, uh, which we're very excited about. So, so these are uh, obviously part of the president's vision for a larger multi-agency national network of manufacturing innovation, uh, which will uh, be comprised of institutes like the ones I just described that are, you know, I mean, they're really public-private partnerships that act as hubs for manufacturing innovation uh, in, in sectors where we really think U.S. manufacturers can gain uh, competitive advantage and keep competitive advantage, and, and then U.S. manufacturing workers can get good uh, family-supporting wages and, and career jobs, right? Weatherization and intergovernmental programs. Um, let me focus here on uh, the um, weatherization assistance formula grants, where we've requested a, a, an increase to really get it back to more of a, a normal level of program operations uh, that that uh, existed um, before the Recovery Act, which have enormous benefits for low-income families across this country. Uh, we've also requested a, an increase for our state energy program uh, to support much more uh, of a sort of a multi-jurisdictional approach to competitive awards uh, where, where high impacts can be achieved and then replicated uh, across states. And then um, our federal energy management uh, program, uh, I'll speed up here, um, uh, um, particular focus on uh, data center energy efficiency, which is, I think many folks know, is a, one of the fastest growing sources of electricity consumption in this country. Uh, there's a lot we can do and pioneer at the, at the federal level, given how many uh, data centers and, and server rooms we've got. Um, we will also continue the support of the President's performance contracting challenge. We've uh, already awarded approximately uh, $1.4 billion of awards towards the $2 billion in the first year uh, of the challenge, uh, and, and uh, FEMP, of course, is, is, is the agency that works with uh, the whole uh, range of federal agencies to enact uh, these energy savings performance contracts. Um, uh, and then finally, Office of Strategic Programs, an office near and dear to my heart, um, where we do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, highlight our technology to market work where really the focus here is to attract new investors uh, to EERE technologies and, and to bridge gaps in, in what I would call the U.S. clean energy ecosystem, right? Um, and so we will be uh, continuing. We actually just put out a funding opportunity announcement uh, for uh, clean energy incubators uh, earlier this year. We'll be continuing that funding. Uh, we'll be uh, funding um, a, a new initiative that we're going to start uh, this year that uh, I think will bring tech transfer out of our, our national labs to a, a new level. So some really exciting uh, stuff here in the tech-to-market space in particular. Um, let me close by talking about a document that has certainly been a big part of my life over the last year, which is the first uh, EERE strategic plan um, in 12 years. Yeah, so the last one, we issued the last one in 2002. It occurs to us a few things have changed. Uh, in the world of, of energy since 2002. And this is our chance to define EERE and, and really clearly explain who we are and, and why we exist and, and to describe our, our, our vision for the future and the role we play in realizing it, uh, which, which includes, I hope, a very clear articulation of the problems we're trying to solve <laughs> uh, and how we're measuring our success in doing so. And we also wanted to connect with our stakeholders. I mean, we want to we ultimately want our stakeholders to see themselves in this plan, right? And, and because so much of our work really, I think, can be accurately de described as a public-private partnership. In fact, most of our work. Um, and, and, it, and it should resonate uh, with all of you. So look for that to come out in the next couple of weeks. We'll uh, announce uh, a webinar about it. We'll, you'll, you'll, you'll see more on this front. And on that note, I will um, uh, turn it over to one of my colleagues. Great. Thank you, Jason. A lot of information, but I must say, I think it's very, very helpful to have Jason walk us through this, and I also encourage you to look at EESI's website so that you can see the um, PowerPoint in, in uh, 
greater detail because I realize how small this print is. So it means that you really do have to focus and concentrate. Uh, but there are enormous opportunities, as, as you just heard. And I think that it's also really important to to think about what this means as far as the the role of government um, and and the kinds of investments that are being made, the kinds of of progress that's been made, as Jason was was talking about, and also how interconnected a lot of these things are. And I was also struck in terms of looking at how many things are, you know, where there is also an integration element in terms of thinking about systems and the integration of those systems, because we really do need to make sure that things really work together. So I now want to turn to someone who has become uh, a another fixture at these annual budget briefings. And that's to Fred Sassine, who is this, uh, an energy policy specialist at the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. And I think this is, is very important, and Fred is backed by popular demand, uh, because he has to answer so many questions for congressional offices on both sides of the, uh, of the Hill. And, and therefore, he has to think about the budget, what this means, the kinds of questions that are going to come up, and what are kind of the key aspects in terms of thinking about themes and, how, and, and providing some context for policymakers and their staffs. Fred? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I noticed a lot of you aren't smiling. Is that because this is such a terribly difficult topic, or I'm not sure, or just because it's Friday? <laughs> and uh, thanks, Carol, for calling me a fixture, I think. Um, well, uh, if you think Jason gave you the whole briefing book on the EER uh, budget request, then my comments aim to be a kind of Twitter version of the EER re request. And uh, I will focus mainly on the requested changes in funding, both in dollars and percent. So I won't talk a lot about the programs and what they do. Jason's already done that. But before I go into the data, I need to make a CRS disclaimer. Um, as all of you may know, CRS was established by law to be a non-biased and non-partisan policy research agency. Thus, I'm required to make an appropriate and dispassionate disclaimer before starting my comments. Please know that any visual resemblance based on the size of my nose or my mustache, uh, that I am not related to any media personalities, including classic cowboy star Leo Carrillo, old-time comedian Ernie Kovacs, nor TV newscaster Geraldo Rivera. Please, uh, no relation to any of them. Well, clearly you see why I gave up on stand-up comedy <laughs> and instead opted for a more exciting career in policy analysis. <laughs> okay, so let's get on with the CRS fact-checking and uh, budget review. Uh, everyone should have a hard copy of the slides in the presentation. I will refer to the slides by number, which is shown in the bottom right-hand corner of each slide. Now, if those are shrunk down, they may be really hard, to, so just count through them. It starts with number one and just goes straight through. Uh, but you will be able to see it on the screen. So um, also note that some slides uh, have a dark blue background. Those are index slides, which lists a group of slides that follows immediately after it. So it's just kind of an organizing technique. So let's start with slide two, titled Outline which provides an ordered list of the blue index slides, which can help you find different sections of the presentation quickly by kind of leafing through. So for example, slide three, again, one of these blue index slides, identifies the five slides that are gonna follow on the overview section. And within that section, slide four on highlights shows that the proposed $416 million increase for EERE accounts for more than half of the 716 million, that's the total EO, uh, DOE requested increase. So that's a huge chunk of the change in what uh, DOE is asking for. Slide five lists the administration's goals for cutting oil imports and for advancing US leadership in global markets for clean energy equipment. 
Unless specified otherwise, I believe these goals are stated relative to a 2010 baseline. Slide six shows the key national interests addressed by EERE's clean energy focus. Uh, as Jason mentioned, international competitiveness is a big one, but climate change and oil imports are also drivers. Slide seven stresses that the budget comparisons employ uh, differences between the FY15 request and the FY14 um, appropriation. And notes that most figures are rounded off for simplicity. Slide eight describes the four functional groupings or themes of major program accounts that DOE employs to organize the account lines in the FY15 request. Uh, namely, that's sustainable transportation, renewable el electricity generation, energy efficiency, and corporate management. Slide nine, uh, one of the blue slides, outlines the section on funding changes by each of the four themes. Slide 10 shows that DOE's sustainable transportation theme brings together the vehicles and bioenergy programs. Historically, these were separated. Uh, vehicles came through the uh, energy efficiency appropriations, which uh, was a completely different um, appropriations stream in the old years, but then later got merged with energy and water. So it brings those two programs together with a combined increase of $90 million. Slide 11 lays out the $72 million increase for the rest of the renewable energy programs, which are focused on electric power production. Slide 12 covers the major changes for the rest of the energy efficiency programs, for which DOE seeks an increase of $241 million. Slide 13 lists the changes for corporate management. This is facilities, um, program direction, and strategic programs. Slides 14 through 16 describe the major funding changes for specific programs. This is probably the level at which most of you will drill down and dig in on. Uh, note, as Jason mentioned, that uh, manufacturing and vehicles would get the largest dollar share of the increases. Slide 17, again a blue slide, introduces the next section, which provides more details about specific programs. Each of these slides covers both goals and funding. Slide 18 shows the strategic elements and dollar increases for the manufacturing program. Uh, as Jason mentioned, this is uh, the big focus and the biggest changes in the budget are proposed for this area. The main increase is sought for advanced manufacturing facilities. Also, a small increase is sought for manufacturing R&D projects. And, of course, the two uh, do work together. Slide 19 provides a breakdown of the increase requested for manufacturing facilities. Uh, this is the big guy for this budget request. I think uh, the increase requested is $109 million. Uh, the largest share of the increase, <clears throat> as Jason noted, is for Clean Energy Manufacturing Innovation Institutes. Say that quickly five times in a row, please. DOE says those institutes support the President's National Network for Manufacturing Innovation. Uh, I think I read uh, there that four of these institutes um, are in place already, not just related to DOE, but other agencies. Five more are due to open this, this sometime this year, and the total goal is for 45 of these institutes altogether. So this is what's going to um, bring the United States into the future with competitiveness on a global scale, not just in EERE programs, but many others. Slide 20 notes that the main priority of the vehicles program is for plug-in electric vehicles to achieve parity with conventional cars. The largest funding increase is for battery and electric drive technologies. Smaller but still hefty increases are sought for outreach and deployment, materials technology, and fuels and lubricants technologies. Slide 21 provides some details about the increases for those vehicle subprograms. Slide 22 breaks down the increase sought for buildings energy efficiency. The largest increase for emerging technologies hardware would focus on new air conditioning technologies and computer models of building energy use. An increase is also sought for rulemakings on appliance efficiency standards 
and for general support for state and local efforts in that area, as Jason mentioned earlier. Slide 23 covers the wind energy request. <clears throat> energy production cost targets are cited for both land-based and offshore wind equipment. Previous funding support uh, for offshore wind farm demonstrations is in process, as Jason mentioned. This request seeks to provide additional funding to support construction of the three demonstration projects. Um, also an increase to address market barriers would focus on offshore wind permitting, environmental impacts, and grid in integration as well. Uh, I want you to note that the last bullet is a mistake, so please scratch that out. Slide 24 on solar energy identifies a six cents per kilowatt hour target for both utility scale solar technologies, that is photovoltaics and con concentrated solar power which uh, in the old days was called solar thermal. <clears throat> this request emphasizes manufacturing and the concentrated solar with um, a reduction for photovoltaics. Slide 25 on bioenergy shows goals for drop-in fuels and algae fuels. Funding would increase for biorefinery demonstrations and feedstocks would be cut back. I think there's some transfer of effort to uh, Department of Agriculture there. Slide 26 on clean energy EDPs describes proposals for two new initiatives, sustainable shale gas growth zones and a local technical assistance program. I won't tell you about those. You can ask Jason about those later. Uh, $14 million altogether, I think, 10 for one and four for the other. Slide 27 notes that funding is requested for two innovation hubs. Uh, I get a fair amount of questions and so do my colleagues about these hubs from time to time. DOE seeks $25 million for the critical materials hub, which uh, I believe mainly supports the manufacturing program. And also DOE seeks $10 million to continue funding at the current level for the buildings hub, which is now identified in the budget document as the PSU Consortium for Building Energy Innovation. Uh, for all of you staff folks, I've included some additional reference material that starts after slide 28. <clears throat> and among these, slide 29 provides some background on the innovation process and demonstration projects. Uh, in general, the developmental gap between R&D and commercialization of technology poses some key financial risk for private companies. Demonstration projects try to help bridge that gap, but tend to be expensive and thus very controversial in the budget process. Slide 30, uh, a blue slide, introduces a section that puts energy efficiency R&D and renewables R&D funding in the context of spending for other DOE energy technology programs. Slide 31 has a pie chart that shows a long-term view of the relative funding that has supported um, the four main energy technology programs, namely nuclear, fossil, renewables, and efficiency. Slide 32 presents a table with the energy technology funding breakdowns for FY13, FY14, and the request for FY15. And then slide 33 presents three pie charts for those same three. FY13, FY14, and FY15. Slide 34, a blue slide, identifies key national interests that shape the framework of issues for policy debates. And slide 35 lists additional CRS resources that may be helpful to staff that work on these budget issues. And finally, um, just one more CRS disclaimer. <clears throat> Many of you know about the famous American commentator, Will Rogers. When asked about the extent of his knowledge on government policy, he famously re remarked that, all I know is what I read in the newspapers. I am today in a direct parallel situation because all I know is what I read in the DOE budget documents. So if you have any difficult or tricky questions about the EERE budget, please, Direct them to DOE's presenter, Jason Walsh. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, thanks so much, Fred. And now you know why Fred is here every year. Um, it, and I also think that uh, what Fred has done is it provides another really, really useful perspective for all of us in terms of looking at the material in the budget that Jason presented so well. And But then what Fred does is, is in terms of looking at some of these other themes, and I think it's also really interesting always to have it put in context in terms of what does this look like historically in terms of where investments have gone and so that we can really see that because I know that lots of times there are a lot of questions that come up in terms of uh, what's being invested on the on the renewable efficiency side versus what's happening on the fossil or nuclear side. And it's really important to sort of make sure that we understand uh, where, where those facts really are. Uh, so now we're going to turn for another perspective to somebody else who I don't know whether I'll call Scott a fixture or not, uh, but someone who uh, has been a very important piece of, that's right, he can be a fixture too. And, uh, but Scott uh, is the, um, uh, the, the president of the Stella Group, and, which is all about the blending of technologies on the efficiency and renewable side. And of course, he has been involved in, in the technology and policy arena for, for many, many years. And he also is the chair of the Sustainable Energy Coalition, of which we both sit on the steering committee. So, Scott, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, well, as you can see, my company uh, blends all these technologies all over the world. And, of course, I work with a lot of new technologies and through the, also with the Department of Defense in utilizing them. Uh, I also am an adjunct professor at George Washington University, teaching two interdisciplinary courses on sustainable energy, sponsored by the law school, the business school, the engineering school, and the science part of the arts and science school, and as well as chair the steering committee for the Sustainable Energy Coalition, which is composed of, of the efficiency renewable trade groups, the analytical groups, and the advocacy groups here in Washington, D.C. So I'm here, though, not to be um, a nice guy. I'm here to be cantankerous a little bit. So give me a little rope on that. Let me just see. So I do want to cover again what Jason said. Uh, we've had increasing investment, as you can see, uh, in the when I started in this field in the 1970s, working up here uh, in the U.S. Senate, and frankly, the entire renewable energy private sector investment was less than what the Pentagon may uh, spent for computer knobs on their mainframe computers. Uh, that has surely changed now, as you can see, uh, in, uh, talking to uh, uh, $244 billion worth of investment. Uh, some saying $269 billion of investment, of private sector investment in these industries. So I want to leave that this is a big set of industries. Efficiency has about $300 billion worth of investments, of private sector investments globally, also rising. And if you want to look at the private sector side of their R&D budgets, which is about 4 or 5%, we're still talking over $10 billion per renewables and other over 10 billion for efficiency. So these industries are spending in, in RD and D uh, more than their respective governments. So you need to know it has changed very definitely from, from the old days. Uh, I also want to say that this is, uh, this was by, put, put out by the Business Council, but you know, when you take a look at 2012, we ad added 17 uh, gigawatts uh, to the grid. Uh, we, are, we are producing about equal or more than natural gas coming on as new electricity to the grid. So this is also astounding from uh, where we were in the old days. Uh, so I want you to be very clear on that. Um, this, is, this was just put out uh, in January by the, the Solar Foundation. And these are the uh, job statistics just on the solar side. And you can see an in installation and manufacturing and, and, and the percentage growth rates from 2012 to 2013. And you can see, you know, 21 percent over, you know, 21 percent installation, 23 percent sales, project development to get projects. So an overall 20 percent growth rate. 
we're seeing similar things in the other renewable energy technologies and efficiency technologies. So, and it is uh, in the um, solar side, because obviously the, we have sunlight in every state of the nation, uh, it is very geographically dispersed, and I want you to be aware of that. And then um, uh, ACEEE just put out this study, uh, which I want you to be very aware of, and this is really cost today, deployed levelized cost of energy efficiency compared to some of the renewables and traditional. And as I, if you took my class at GW, you would know it's always less expensive to save energy than produce it from any resource. This is the now the great chart I'm going to use. Uh, but I want you to be aware of that, that if you want really to increase the penetration rates of some of the renewable technologies, whether it's electricity, thermal, or fuels, uh, if you're using less, it will be far more cost effective and it will be far more quicker to do. So if you want to make impact, whether that's importing fuel or reducing Clean Air Act emissions or climate greenhouse gas emissions or use of water, since energy, the conversion extraction use of energy uses more water than irrigation, it is our largest water user, uh, these are things you need to be aware of. So here is the DOE budget, and I want to say, so Jason is not hurt that it's a good budget. It's a thoughtful and good budget. But I'm not here to compliment you on this budget, so I'm going to want to talk to you. And I just want to say the devil is in the details. I'm going to go through a few of them just to give you some, some meat for the, this afternoon. First of all, on the geothermal, I, I went to every trade group and said, what do you think about this on the efficiency renewable side? And I got about eight answers. And again, most of them support it. But I, I, I picked the geothermal one because I, I sort of liked it the most. I thought it was uh, pretty insightful. And they said, you know, uh, the geothermal budget's gone up. It used to be one of the things uh, the Department of Energy handed off, both Republican and Democrats, to, you know, that and the marine energy budget to get rid of. So that was nice. Concent also concentrated solar. And so that's good, and it's going up. And Jason talked about this new uh, research facility to, to deal with GPS and to be better find resource assessment of geothermal resources. Very important. If you took my class, you would know a great MIT study which showed conservatively geothermal could meet 10% of U.S. electricity. Conservatively, probably twice that amount with technology we have today, and that's 24-hour power. But I'm not here to talk about that. What the geothermal industry says is, hey, you know, yeah, resource assessment's good, and new ton of technology development's good, but the real barrier in the market beyond tax policy is the fact that there's a lot of drilling risk. Yeah, I can identify that resource, but what's the risk to get to that resource? What are the tools? And so they need better technical, analytical, market-oriented tools, and they need that dialogue with the finance community, the people who finance the drilling, so we can accelerate drilling and the risks are clear. So this is something where uh, DOE actually did a little more of a decade ago and now has sort of walked away from that and looking at some other things. So I want to say that each of these programs have some key issue, barrier issues that need to deal with. So that's a geothermal one. Um, I also don't want you to look at budget numbers here. I want you to understand that uh, most of the work is done by the national labs, partnership with the universities, and then requests for proposals the, of what they want to industry. And it is collaborative. I have no problem. But I want you to highlight what I'm talking about here is the fact that I want you to think about something. It takes a year to 18 months to conceive of a need within the Department of Energy. You need to get OMB sign-off. You need to get Hill sign-off. And that takes another year. And then uh, you need to actually develop the program once it's been approved and actually implement it. That takes another year. At best, we're talking three years. Well, this technology is changing very fast, just like your laptop and, and your cell phone. 
So what was a very good thought three years ago and what money is going out sometimes doesn't really touch the edge. So we need smarter, more agile ways. There is one, only one program that I really believe has dealt with that issue, and that's this manufacturing initiative. They have really developed a way to interdisciplinary with the different sectors, make it very agile and very market-oriented. And, you know, I could see the same thing going with the glass industry and tinted glass and photovoltaics and, thin, and films and window films. I could see the same thing going on with photovoltaics, wind and storage systems. I could see the same thing dealing with molten salts and combined heat and power and solar thermal. There are a whole range of blending of technology in more agile, organic ways, and the program needs to embrace more of that. Uh, they do have sort of a non-invented here syndrome at some of the labs, and that also needs to be changed. The second issue is small business. DOE programs are much better to work at with larger businesses because those are the ones that write wonderful proposals. God bless them. And I like medium size and large businesses. I work with many of them. But in fact, in the United States, most of the innovation actually comes from small businesses. They also employ slightly more than half the people. So there isn't the kind of ease and portals for small businesses to interact unless you're playing the exact game that the lab or headquarters or the university feels is correct. There needs to be better portals for the businesses that are in your different states to interact with this program in a much more user-friendly way. Let's put it that way. Uh, last, oh, and by the way, a great article, uh, a great report just released by the Small Business Administration on uh, small businesses' role in innovation in the green sector. And I hope you look at that in my presentation. Um, lastly, um, while they have technology silos and they do have um, some interdisciplinary things going on, the planning needs to be really uh, done, I think, maybe through your strategic office in a different way. I, I noticed that cybersecurity was, went down in DOE, yet a lot of these energy efficiency and renewable technologies is exactly what folks like me are do, doing to have autonomous systems to deal with cybersecurity issues and grid resiliency issues. I see a lot of the smart grid work more on the technology side not really looking at the resiliency, the terrorism, the human error, the climate issues and change impacts. So we need to figure out how to better team uh, the wide and depth and breadth of the EERE technologies to solve pressing issues that other agencies are looking at, but we supply the answer. I lastly want to point out that um, uh, I have tons of studies. I have the 26 I give to my class I'm happy to share with you that I consider are the critical clean energy studies of the moment. Um, we are having, uh, through the Sustainable Energy Coalition and the Renewable Energy Energy Efficiency Caucuses, or CAUCI, uh, at the end of July, our annual uh, uh, expo here in the House Caucus Room. And EESI will let you know, but I hope you come to see the companies from around the country. We're going to have maps on resources, employment, manufacturing. I want to disabuse you of the notion that, you know, everything is made in China. You know, I just ribbon cut a new photovoltaic manufacturing uh, plant in Miss Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, we have some of the most advanced efficiency and renewable manufacturing in the world going on here. And, and it is almost in every state of this country. So I urge you to visit some plants, come to the expo, and frankly, dig in a little deeper to make sure your small businesses and your industries can feel a part of these programs that I believe is a very good budget and a very good proposal. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I think there's a lot of exciting things going on and enormous potential. Um, it's hard to kind of have a grasp of all of these things and 
and how they work together, but hopefully you will all feel free to uh, talk to any of our speakers and follow up with us at EESI as well. And, and I must say that I think that as, as Scott was talking, the, um, the, the more that we learn in terms of what is also happening across the country, uh, in terms of actions being taken by states, by local governments, uh, by all sorts of, of entrepreneurs and, and small and large businesses. It is really exciting and it's also important to recognize that if you were, for example, looking at a wind turbine or whatever, it's you know, it's comprised of a lot of components that the supply chain goes across a lot of different states. And that's true with regard to all sorts of these technologies. And that makes the whole thing, in terms of thinking about these maps that I think we all need to do a better job of developing, it makes it absolutely fascinating because everybody's got a stake in these investments and what's going on. But let's open it up for your discussion. Obviously, this whole area needs to be um, a continued dynamic discussion because things are changing so quickly. It's absolutely incredible. So let's open it up for your uh, questions, comments, and if you could just identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Rachel Levin. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg BNA. Um, I was actually wondering if uh, Jason could talk a little bit more about the strategic plan and um, what the timeline of that looks like for the webinar that's going to be announced. Sure. Um, uh, I expect that we will release uh, our strategic plan probably the week of uh, April 14th. Um, I, I, I can't make a commitment there. That's, that's sort of an estimate at this point. It, it will be released in April. Uh, and, and as I mentioned briefly uh, in my remarks, I mean, this is, um, this is a strategic plan that, that not only describes what we're doing currently, but what we uh, uh, expect to be doing and focusing on um, over the next five years. Um, and so it, it, it lays out, as I uh, suggested briefly uh, in my earlier remarks, uh, our, our mission, our vision, our strategic goals uh, as an office, uh, our, our success indicators, how, how we measure success in terms of what we're doing. And, and then really the bulk of it is laying out our strategies. Um, and, um, and we go into quite a bit of detail uh, with, with strategies that are designed to meet each of what are seven uh, strategic goals. Um, it, it also will uh, articulate, hopefully quite clearly, sort of how we go about um, uh, making investments. Uh, we have a, a limited budget, and so we actually have to have a logic model right, for how we invest uh, in our portfolio and make decisions across different technologies which, which actually um, you know, uh, uh, evolve and come down a cost curve, and, and, and then that presents us with a whole set of new choices. So that's a little bit more detail. Uh, obviously, um, when, and, and I, I can't tell you right now when we're going to do a webinar because we don't have a date yet, but we'll, we'll be able to provide a lot more information about that. And, and we should actually, I should get your card before uh, I leave today. Yes, <clears throat> John Scheidler from Future Past in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, another question for Jason. I noticed uh, uh, in your discussion of bioenergy, uh, you mentioned drop-in fuels, and th this uh, this term is very important to a lot of people because it means that uh, the supply chain can be used to distribute the fuel without a lot of modification and so on. However, um, what we're also learning from the experience that EPA has had with its uh, renewable uh, identification number um, program, uh, that when there's a financial incentive to produce biofuels, you may get some bad actors uh, committing biofuel fraud and, and not selling biofuel when they when they say that they're selling biofuel. So my question to you is, uh, have you considered uh, any uh, approach or um, 
initiatives uh, to help uh, deal with uh, the the need to track uh, the sustainability information associated with bioenergy uh, to prevent uh, fraudulent actors and also to have a good accounting of the extent to which bioenergy is integrated into the supply chain. I, I can't say that we have, and, and, uh, and it's a little bit out of our, our mission space in terms of, of our bioenergy technology office. We, we actually we, we, we pay, play an enforcement role very rarely uh, within our office. I mean, we, we basically have three buckets of work, right? It's the R&D work, which is all about uh, driving down cost, improving performance. Uh, it is the what I would call the testing and validation work, which is the demonstration, some of which I, I told you about here, the offshore wind demonstration being a classic example. And then there are a whole set of market barrier reduction activities we engage in. Um, enforcement is, is typically handled by uh, uh, our colleagues at, at EPA uh, and in other agencies, and they, of course, get a lot of love uh, for, for that. Um, you, you pose an interesting question. I, I, I don't know if my colleagues within the bioenergy technology office have ever considered whether we, you know, we can interpret our mission space accordingly. I, I think you're raising a real issue, but it's not really something that we've considered part of our mission space. Okay. Um, other questions, comments? Okay, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Jason, you're getting bombarded, but uh, Jordan Blackman um, from Energy Horizons Clean Energy, uh, uh, Clean Technology Consulting. <clears throat> um, with, with regard to the Clean Energy Manufacturing Initiative, um, uh, what are, you know, I know there's this national network of manufacturing institutes, but what are some of the ways that you're, you're getting the renewable energy technology programs to collaborate more with the Advanced Manufacturing Office um, you, you know, to work on planning and implementing um, a competitive, um, you know, increasing the competitiveness of clean energy manufacturing? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And um, I, I think there's quite a bit of work between our advanced manufacturing office and uh, our other technology offices, um, primarily around what we would consider to be um, platform technologies, right, cross-cutting technologies that are applicable across a number of different uh, technology spaces and industry sectors. So I actually, I gave the example uh, of uh, our carbon fiber work, right, which obviously our advanced manufacturing office does a lot of work on, but that, you know, that is, uh, I mentioned the applicability within the automotive sector. Uh, I mean, our, our, our uh, vehicle technologies office is pitching in money for a, you know, a, a carbon fiber demonstration facility that, that we support um, at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So uh, we're doing some very similar things within our solar office where, uh, again, uh, our advanced manufacturing folks um, and uh, our solar folks are working together in a very collaborative way to look at ways in which we can um, uh, in, in drive down technology cost in, in a number of different ways. You, you mentioned the Clean Energy Manufacturing Initiative, which is really an umbrella initiative that tries to pull together um, all of our manufacturing work across our technology offices to, um, to, to kind of provide a coherent approach to how we're approaching these things. And so it, that's very central to what we're doing with that particular initiative. Yeah, if I may add to that, um, since I work with the program, is um, a lot of the issues facing the renewables and particularly relate to material science and new ways to create new materials. And if you're looking at offshore wind and the marine energy side, you know, water is a very unforgiving medium and, uh, you know, 700 times more dense than wind and salt and acid in it, among other things. So... Uh, they are really developing these material science collaboratives with the industry um, at some of these centers. Uh, same is true for battery research, and same is true for um, uh, thin, the, the newer kinds of the nanotechnology thin films that are coming out in photovoltaics. So we're seeing uh, these centers are going to be very important to, to be able to take technology that's hidden or being pushed by one industry niche and, and and making it relevant to and open to these other niches so what i was whining about in my presentation is exactly what this program is doing 
and doing potentially quite successfully. Obviously, all this is really critically important in terms of thinking about the the enormous challenges in terms of global competition. Absolutely. And it really makes this whole area extraordinarily exciting and critical. Absolutely. Um, okay, back here. Thank you. Uh, my name is George Hutchinson. I work with Concurrent Technologies Corporation. I'm going to try and fire off two quick questions. Uh, Jason and, and Scott, if you could follow up on it. The question is, um, you know, it looks like there's a, a pretty robust amount uh, being asked for in the vehicle technology space. And currently, the Department of Defense is, is uh, executing a, a large vehicle-to-grid program across several DOD installations. And there's some promising uh, results burgeoning, um, which would show the effectiveness of electric vehicles being used in an ancillary market sense mm -hmm. to help premiumize the, uh, the, you know, lessen the cost of the battery, bring down the overall cost of the vehicle, and then help advance electric vehicle penetration into the, uh, into the state's that are selling the electric vehicles. So it looks like it uh, was some promising results. My question is, is the Vehicle Technologies Office, with its portfolio, will they be looking at any specific vehicle-to-grid technologies? Uh, and then for Scott, um, because you have experience uh, with the, the DOD, DOE uh, interface and, uh, and the existing MOU, uh, do you see promising developments in that space, and could that be applied potentially in this area? Thank you. And my answer, unfortunately, is fairly short. We, I mean, we are interested in that. Um, we have not done a lot of work in, in this area. There, there is an issue of, what, of, no pun intended, but what lane we drive in here in terms of... Oh, very uh, good, uh, Jason. Very good. Uh, in, 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 term, <laughs> uh, in terms of other, what, what, other, what other federal agencies are doing uh, in this space. Um, it's a great question, and you know, not only is it this collaboration a way to um, reduce technology costs, but it, again, it, it addresses other issues. The way the reason military is actually interested in it came out of September 11th, frankly, is that if you have a grid failure, uh, can you keep the activities of the bases going, and not only just driving around vehicles, but using it to stabilize and harden, and in some cases, back up critical functions. And uh, we're just at the, at the cusp of understanding the benefits of this. But this answers another problem, and, I, and I'm not putting Jason on the spot for this. This really has to go a little bit higher. And uh, something I've been doing with the Quadrennial Energy Review that's also coming out of DOE and, and dialogue with the White House is, you know, you have a whole homeland security agenda, you have a military agenda, you have an uh, energy and technology agenda, you have a, an environmental and emissions agenda. And there are times, and this kind of uh, grid-connected vehicle issues, where all those issues merge very neatly together. How do you drive it, and how do you draw on the resources of the different agencies in a collaborative and coordinative and supporting manner to get there faster, not slower? Uh, now, that's easier said than done, but is it very important? It is a critical issue and we really need to figure out a way to do that better. And we actually, we need some better understanding of that up here on the Hill. And because, you know, and from both parties, it doesn't go against anything either party stands for to help drive this agenda a little further, pun intended as well. Thank you. And this is also an area in terms of thinking about the whole Office of Electricity and Resilience. Absolutely. Where all of this comes together in terms of thinking about the value of ancillary services. And I know that the certainly the former chairman of FERC of the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission was extremely interested in this whole area and that there has been a lot of work um, underway on this too because you've got a lot of different players, but I know that PJM um, in, in terms of a local or I should say regional system operator um, has been very, very interested in that and doing a lot of work with um, folks out of the University of Delaware, for example, in terms of really looking at that and how you can bring some of these things together. And I think that's happening in a number of other places around the country as well. So, but a lot to do in a lot of moving pieces to to pun intended there. There, yes, there you go. Good. Absolutely. Three good puns we just can't help ourselves. We can't help ourselves. Um, okay, go ahead. 
sorry, Amory. <laughs> Amory, you're getting a lot of exercise today. It's great. <laughs> Good afternoon. Roy Williams with Future Past. Uh, 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 we're, of course, talking about the worst constraint of all, and that's the, con the uh, federal budget process. But uh, there was some mention of rare earths, platinum, and other uh, raw materials that are part of uh, our transition. And uh, I was just curious if the panel had any comments on are there particular constraints, either that there's not enough of that raw material on the earth or that they tend to come from countries that are difficult to get a reliable source of those raw materials and how that Sorry, impacts us. Go, go well, first I want to laud uh, DOE for, for looking at rare earths and other things. But what we saw from that a few years back, China announcing they were going to curtail red earths and, of course, it had re repercussions over the world that they didn't even expect and they sort of backed down on it. But it was uh, it actually was a gift because all these metals and materials are in a global market. And even if it's not a willful withholding, it could be just that there's a war going on or we, there's a drought and we can't mine it. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why there will be shortages at different times for critical materials. Wouldn't it be smarter of us to anticipate that that's going to happen, uh, educate our industries, work with them, get our national labs and our universities to say, let us confront this, let's bring the best minds to bear, and then and let's have options. It's really having options. Some of it may never be replaced per se, except in certain times. And there are trade-outs. And so just like drop-in fuels, you want other kinds of drop-in materials into the manufacturing process, whether it's turbine technology or anything else. So uh, DOE is aware of it, and they're starting. Uh, the Department of Defense is very aware of this as well. I get asked about this and the systems I'm dealing with with DOD. Supply chain, not just where it's manufactured, but the materials for that manufacture, is on their mind every day. That's what scares them. So uh, this is going to be a, a, a very, very critical issue, and many of you in the audience uh, from all your different perspectives uh, have a lot to add to that dialogue and preparing, because a lot of these industries – except with strategic planners within companies like Jason at DOE, uh, don't think about this stuff unless the price goes up. That's too late. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just I'll answer that quickly in, in a couple of different ways. I, I, I spent most of my remarks uh, in, in terms of our, of our advanced manufacturing office budget request on, on the national network of manufacturing uh, innovation uh, and some of our institutes related to that. We also have a, a critical materials hub, uh, which is based uh, at our uh, relatively small national lab in Ames, Iowa, which has really hit the ground running over the last couple of years in terms of developing uh, some some uh, alternatives to critical materials. Uh, I, th I think they've they've already got something like nine patents for some of the R and D that they have worked. Um, I, I will also just sort of echo what I said earlier. I mean, some, some of what we do in the R&D space is looking for alternatives within particular technology applications, right? So uh, our, I mentioned the, the, that our vehicle technologies office is looking for, for alternatives, particularly in the EV space, uh, for some of the critical materials that are used there. So we try to come at it both from an R&D standpoint, well, an R&D standpoint, but coming at it from slightly different vantage points. I, I would just add that that interest or, or, or that topic has received quite a bit of interest up here on the hill. Uh, there have been several hearings with regard to looking at rare earths. Um, what, you know, what are the, some of the geopolitical um, uh, issues involved? How do we, you know, what are the options for moving forward? And we've also done a couple briefings on that. Uh, because of congressional concerns that are raised. So there is information on our website uh, from those briefings as well. And a, a, just a couple other points I would mention because I think that we had some of the folks from Ames at, uh, at one of these briefings. But, but in addition to thinking about um, increased production of rare earths, here in the U.S. because that also has stepped up yes. uh, as a result of sort of the scare after China made those uh, comments several years ago. And, and in terms of looking for other kinds of alternatives, at the same time, there's also a very, very important issue in terms of recycling the materials that are in all of this e-waste. So that, because it really can create a lot of damage 
let alone a huge waste of resources rather than reclaiming it and reusing it. Yeah. Um, we'll take, if there's one more question, okay, back here. Um, hello, uh, my name is Prab, and I wanted to know um, how tentative is DOE in regards with hydropower making it as a renewable power or not? Because I see at certain conferences that, you know, DOE states uh, hydropower as non renewable, and at certain times they see it as renewable. So, has there been like a tentative decision made on hydropower being as a renewable or as a non renewable in upcoming years? We are very unconfused about about whether hydropower is considered renewable. We, we, it, it is a renewable energy resource, and it's and it's a very important one because it is base load power. Absolutely. And um, the 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 focus of our uh, initiative on hydropower is to take advantage of the fact that we've got eighty thousand dams in this country, right? Only three percent of which uh, are, are actually generating hydroelectricity, and so th there is a lot more we can do. Uh, to uh, generate electricity from our existing infrastructure, which uh, is a hell of a lot easier than building new stuff. Uh, and there are ways of, of doing it. I mean, we've got, a, a, for example, a fish-friendly turbine that we have been developing with our uh, private sector partners for a number of years that, that we want to put out there in the field and, 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 and start deploying in really significant ways. So uh, we, we, we are not at all confused uh, about hydropower. It is, it is a, a, an absolutely critical part of, of the renewable energy resource mix. And DOE has also done turbines that are just more efficient, meaning for the same site, you're just getting more power out of it. How, how great is that? Why wouldn't we want that? And work under lower water conditions as we experience uh, changes in climate and, dr and have higher droughts so that you're still able to, to get outputs uh, with, with, lower, uh, with lower head in the, behind, the, behind the dam. So it's very exciting. As, as well as being more fish friendly so that it's sort of a whole, again, um, uh, uh, multiple benefits all coming out of that very, very important research and yeah. development of these, of these turbines. We've also, I mean, I should mention StreamReach as well, and where we've been developing more, more modular systems, which have a lot of potential and, and, and very, I mean, we actually call it low impact uh, uh, new development uh, mm -hmm. or LIND, uh, which has, uh, I, mean, I mean, just the, the resource potential in, in streams, of course, there are a lot of streams in this country is, is, is significant. So we want to really be driving that more as well. Yeah, a lot of interesting stuff in terms of marine kinetic um, and looking at different kinds of conduits that can also provide power. It's just amazing when you start to look all of the different places that you can pick up energy that can be tapped, which just makes everything much more efficient. So I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our speakers very, very much. Appropriation season is really underway now. And there are a lot of appropriations hearings that are happening. I know that members have to get their requests in. Uh, in fact, this next week in terms of looking at their priorities. So uh, there is a lot of activity around budget, uh, asking questions. I'm sure that Fred is probably getting a lot of issues raised. Fred, do you want to say I something about this? Is, uh, uh, there was a recent uh, newsletter article that mentioned that uh, it looks like on the political side, a lot of people are going to be interested in policy writers here. <clears throat> and already there's some skepticism whether they can complete all of the 12 appropriation bills. <laughs> gotcha. so, That's a shock. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people were hoping that this year was going to be... Regular order. Right, oh, right. No, sure. yeah. what? So, uh, in terms of the energy and water appropriations, it right. really covers DOE. Uh, other than... So we will see because it is once again going to be quite a year. So I want to thank all of you. This very, very helpful, terrific job. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And the materials, again, will be up on EESI's website. So please feel free to contact myself or, or any of our staff with regard to questions that you've got or, of course, any of our speakers. Thanks.